Jungle Deep, the podcast that explores the tropical lifestyle. Hello and welcome to the podcast, Jungle Deep. This is your host, Dr. Jones. We are on safari and I'm here with you to learn, to have fun, and to explore the jungle. We are going to talk with our field correspondent, Stephanie Arney, from the Honolulu Zoo about sloths. If you were lucky enough to spot one in the trees of the South American rainforest, it would look like a stringy clump of moss and algae in the branches overhead. It wouldn't seem to move because they move so slowly. And because they live upside down, hanging from tree branches, you wouldn't recognize one as being an animal at all. But when you get to know a sloth that has been all cleaned up, you find that they are delightful creatures and downright cute. Well, thanks to Stephanie, we're going to get to know sloths. We have a full slate of fascinating guests coming up for Jungle Deep. Authors, filmmakers, conservationists, and even jungle explorers are on the list. Next episode, we will have a very special guest. We will meet the amazing Duet de Toy. He is the one I call the real African Tarzan. That's because he does live in Africa, and much of the time he lives as Tarzan lived, in the jungles, cavorting with elephants, pythons, and jungle vines. This Tarzan is complete with gorgeous muscles, a stylish loincloth, and a love for wildlife. This guy is the real deal. It's taken me months to arrange, but we will finally get to talk to this modern-day Tarzan. Gather the kids around. It's a Jungle Deep exclusive. Don't miss it. But first, a word about tropical rainforest destruction and its role in climate change. I often say that tropical rainforest destruction is our number one environmental problem. That surprises many people because tropical rainforest destruction is invisible to most and rarely discussed. While climate change seems more threatening, is more visible, and is beginning to be mentioned by our nation's leaders. So why do I put such an emphasis on the need for tropical rainforest conservation? Climate change is quickly becoming mankind's most pressing environmental problem. The most profitable and powerful corporate interests in history, the oil companies, have led efforts to create legions of skeptics and deniers. However, most people are now convinced that our scientists are correct. After all, we have all experienced extreme weather events for ourselves in recent years. Climate change is finally getting some mention by our nation's leaders and increasing discussion on alternative media. However, it is not currently being discussed in some 90 plus percent of commercial media stories about weather. Our nation's media outlets are adding to the lethargy in responding to this crisis. There is another facet to this problem that is too rarely discussed. On top of the problem of climate change not being mentioned in most media stories about severe weather events is the fact that a major contributor to climate change is getting no mention at all. Most people are aware that CO2 emissions from burning fossil fuels are creating a greenhouse effect in the atmosphere, warming the planet. But are most people aware that tropical rainforest destruction contributes 20 to 25 percent to global warming? That its contribution to the greenhouse effect is roughly equal to the contribution made by the world's transportation sector? Surprising, yes, and seldom mentioned. With rainforest destruction playing such a major role, as much as one quarter of the problem, in resulting climate change, there is an opportunity to make great progress in ways that are in addition to the challenge of getting away from carbon-based fuels. Tropical rainforests sequester huge amounts of carbon in their foliage. As these forests are cut and burned, that carbon is released into the atmosphere. 
In addition, the ongoing absorption of CO2 that dense forests provide is reduced or ceases to exist. Further, large areas of forest destruction disrupt natural water and energy cycles, causing abnormal weather deviations that aggravate climate change. In addition, albedo, the reflectivity of sunlight from the region's surface, is changed, affecting weather. Half of the world's tropical rainforests have been destroyed. Despite 40 years of environmental activism, the destruction of the tropical rainforest is continuing and has not yet slowed. Considering all of this, it is easy to understand how rainforest destruction contributes to climate change worldwide. I am sorry to say that tropical rainforest destruction creates another horrible problem that affects the entire planet and will have profound effects upon civilization going forward. That is biodiversity depletion, or species extinction. Medicines and food are just some of the benefits that biodiversity provides, not just to indigenous people, but to all of civilization. Biodiversity is the reservoir of life from which we draw upon and will continue to need to advance our way of life. All living things, including humans, are interdependent. We absolutely need each other. This web of life is our foundation, our support. Most living things live in the rainforest. Species diversity is extreme and concentrated in these forests. As we destroy the forests, we are destroying species of life at a rate of 1,000 to 10,000 times greater than the natural background rate. We are punching a big hole in the web of life on our planet. While the causes of climate change are, to a great degree, reversible, destruction of our planet's biodiversity is not. Extinction is forever. Tackling tropical rainforest destruction can help to curtail both biodiversity depletion and climate change a topic certainly worthy of far more public attention. It must be a part of climate change discussions. We must swiftly and abundantly create a broad public demand for tropical rainforest conservation.
I'm with Stephanie Arney from the Honolulu Zoo, and Stephanie is our field correspondent about wildlife. She's our wildlife educator, and Stephanie, say hi. Are you there? Aloha, everybody. Oh, that's right. It's aloha in Hawaii. And what's the weather like in Hawaii? It is perfect today. Oh, I could have guessed. <laughs> it's perfect every day. I know. I know it's a, it's a, my running joke. I have to ask you. <laughs> that's because I'm freezing up here in Northern California right now. And I'm just wishing I were there. Okay, well, we're going to talk about an adorable creature that lives up in the trees of the rainforest. It's called the sloth. And you have a sloth there at the uh, Honolulu Zoo, don't you? We do. We have one male two-toed sloth. He's about eight years old, and his name is Quando. Tell us, how in the world did you get a sloth named Quando? (laughs) <laughs> I like that name. When Quando first came in, he didn't have a name. He was around two or three years old. And sometimes zoos will do naming contests. And we decided to do that. So we involved our community. A little boy that was seven years old sent in a poem. And in that poem, it stated, said something along the lines of, sloths are really slow, have a really low metabolism. They spend a lot of time up in the trees. But when you go to see the sloths, all you think to yourself is, when is it going to move? When is it going to eat? When is it going to poo? <laughs> when is it going to be done sleeping? So you keep saying the word when. And he connected that sloths are from Central and South America. And some of the countries, they obviously speak Spanish. So he connected that together, calling him when in Spanish, cuando. Hmm. Cool, yeah. huh? Yeah, I like that name a lot. Good name for a sloth. Like. When is something going to happen? (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) you know, and when you come to zoos, a lot of the time you don't really get to see sloths because either they're hiding in a hammock or hiding up in the trees, whatever it may be. They don't really go right in front of the public because they want to be comfortable and cozy when they sleep. Because just so you know, they are nocturnal and they do spend a majority of their time sleeping about 15 hours a day. And they need to do that because they have really low metabolism. You know, they need to rest a lot of the times. Well, they are a really different kind of animal, a different kind of mammal than most. They're really kind of peculiar. They, they got the built-in hangers there with those giant claws where they can just hang and hang and not use any muscles in order to stay put. They can sleep in that position. They're upside down more than any other animal on the planet. And they, they run at half speed. Everything in their life is, uh, they're just very slow. Their their body functions are slow. I think you told me their temperatures were lower than normal, or what we think of as normal for a mammal. And everything about them is just, they're kind of weird. And yet they're, they're so cute. <laughs> you know, where, where, tell us, tell our listeners, where do you find them in the wilds? Where do sloths come from? Where you're going to find them in the world is Central and South America. And there are six different kinds of sloths. There are four three-toed sloths and two two-toed sloths. All of them are arboreal, and you've already talked about how they spend a majority of their time up in the trees and how they're so perfectly adapted for that. They're all nocturnal, and they are close to being omnivorous. Majority of the time, they're going to be eating shoots and leaves and fruits, but they might also go for some small, uh, maybe some small rodents or possibly insects if they can catch that as well but they are all very unique looking you're absolutely right and those claws that they have are extremely long and you what you'll notice is that they're about two or four inches long they use them to hook themselves on so they can stay put for long periods of time and like you said they do everything upside down they're upside down more than even bats They mate upside down, they give birth upside down, they eat, they sleep, and they have even been known to be found hanging dead for long periods of time. Oh, dear. (laughs) So they die upside down. (laughs) Yeah, everything is upside down. Isn't that peculiar when you think about it? I mean, the world's full of animals, and and of course, all all the birds and mammals that live up in the trees, and these are the only guys that live up in the trees upside down all the time. That's yeah, very, super very special. And because they're up there for such long periods of time, they start to grow this bluish greenish algae on their fur, which is perfect for them because it helps them blend in very well up in the treetops. 
especially when they need that camouflage to protect themselves and hide from their predators, such as jaguars, which are going to be on the ground floor, and harpy eagles, which are going to be looking up from the canopy. So that algae actually really helps them out for survival. And I've heard that if they have gone periods of time without eating all the foods that I just mentioned, that they have even been seen eating the algae that's growing on their fur. The only enemies they have are jaguars on the forest floor, and they don't come down very often. And then those harpy eagles. Now, I don't know if, if, if you've seen harpy eagles before, yep. but those are big, beautiful, magnificent birds of prey. They are massive. They take pop collar monkeys out of trees all the time. Yeah, I was going to say they go after monkeys a lot, I understand. So they go after a sloth that they could see one, but they're so well hidden because of that long hair and with the green algae growing in it, and they're moving so slow. I mean, it's very hard to see a sloth. Can you imagine if they did see a sloth? That's carrying, I mean, depending on the species, they range between 11 and 20 pounds each. Can you imagine a harpy eagle picking that up out of the trees? I wonder if he would swoop down and fall. I read that those sloths do not have incisors, which are those sharp front teeth that most animals use for biting. They have just molars that they use for, or so the leaves. They eat primarily leaves, and so they use the molars for grinding the leaves up. But I guess they can't bite you. Is, is that true? I have read that with other species of sloths. I've been in with our sloth here, uh, Quando, and he's a lens two-toed sloth, and he definitely has sharp teeth. He has four very, very sharp teeth. He ah. could bite. But when you watch him eat, his favorite food, by the way, is papaya. If he doesn't fall asleep in the middle of reaching out for you, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's not uh, like you couldn't get away from we, him. <laughs> we brought out the papaya. That's his favorite fruit. So he got really excited. And believe it or not, he did move quite quickly over to the papaya, much faster than I expected. But when he got over to the papaya, he grabbed it with his hook and he squished it in between those long claws and in, in the bottom part of his, his hand. And he held that in place. And then he hooked himself upside down like normal. As he started to eat, he would kind of use his lips. Their lips are really strong. All, all sloth species lips are strong because, like you said, some of them don't have those incisor teeth. So they have to try to pretty much squish open some fruits. But thankfully, with mm. the lens two-toed, he has those sharp teeth, so he can somewhat give a good bite in. But I did get very up close to watch him eat, and his eyes rolled behind his head, and he was drooling all over himself. <laughs> you could tell he was loving it. Uh, so it was a very interesting way of eating, and it makes me really curious to see how they eat other fruits. Because I saw him eat an apple, and he had to open his mouth really, really large, and his claw, with the combination of his claw and teeth, kind of held him in place, and his mouth crushed it open. Yeah, it's very interesting to watch them eat, that's for sure. I would love to see them eat, you know, a, a small rodent. That would be interesting to see if they could even catch it. But yeah, do, yeah, I would, we feed we feed our a primary uh, our herbivorous diet. Hmm. Did you say there's seven species? Six species. Six species. Or the three of sloths. and two of the two. And all sloths have three toes in the back, which is pretty interesting. <laughs> but yeah. twos have the two toes in the front. But there's more differences than just the number of claws they have on their front feet. Tell us yep. a little bit about some of those differences. Apparently, the three toed sloths are slower, which doesn't say a whole lot, <laughs> but they are slower and a little bit smaller. Remember earlier we were talking about how they, oh, maybe we didn't mention it here yet, but they do descend once a week out of the treetops so that they can defecate or poo. A defecate's way too scientific sounding to me. They come down to poo once a week. And when they do, the two-toed sloth goes head first down and the three-toed sloth goes bottom first down. After they poo, they cover it with dirt, kind of like a cat would cover their feces. That could be mm -hmm. an, another adaptation to just cover up where they've been so that possibly a jaguar wouldn't sniff it out and assume that there's a you know something yummy to eat up in the tree above so I find, I found that really cool when I learned about that one and they only have to do that once a week yeah once a week and it's because their metabolism is so slow and they have huge like mo I've heard most of their body is just made up of their stomachs and what I thought is really cool is that they can store that their urine and their feces in their body for that entire week, right? But it makes up about 30% of their weight. Mm. That is gross. <laughs> so it, Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe it should come down out of the tree a little more often. Maybe more often. <laughs> As I understand it, there's not a lot of nutrition in leaves, and they do eat mostly leaves. And so I guess they look kind of like cattle do. They They have to 
they use bacteria to help break down the the, the, the leaf material in their stomachs. It goes through many chambers. It takes a really long time to go through all mm -hmm. the different systems in their stomach. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, and a lot of monkeys do that as well, and and that's why you'll see. Um, I'll give you two other examples of animals that eat similar to a sloth: panda and a koala. Koalas can eat the eucalyptus, and pandas are going to eat bamboo, but they eat that one source, and unfortunately, it doesn't give them a lot of nutrition. And those particular animals, because of that, do sleep a whole lot because it is just exhausting eating those foods and how much energy it does take to uh, metabolize it. So I was pretty neat. <laughs> You are listening to Jungle Deep. Deep. In the world of tiki culture, there is one major annual event every tiki fan wants to attend. It's the Hookie Lao in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. The world's most authentic tiki event. Listen to all the greatest tiki bands, enjoy exotic food and drink, watch hula dancers and mermaids swimming in the pool. It's all at the great Hookie Lao. The Hokey Lao this year is happening June 6th through 9th. Register right away, click the links on our homepage, or search for the Hokey Lao on Facebook. I hope I see you there. My name is Ali. I run purses for primates, and I sort my purses while listening to Jungle Deep. This is the Vedu Toy. I'm the Tarzan from Africa, and I bathe my elephant while I'm listening to Jungle Deep podcast. Hi, I'm Al Bowl, film producer of Tars and Lord of Louisiana Jungle, and I clean my lenses while listening to Jungle Deep. The beautiful Honolulu Zoo welcomes you in the spirit of aloha to come and explore their tropical paradise filled with exotic animals. Much more than a typical zoo experience, the Honolulu Zoo offers many specialized programs for the entire family. Look into their vacation adventures, Kiki's Night Out, Stargazing at the Zoo, Twilight Tours, and Snooze in the Zoo Overnight Adventures. All of this and more is available through the zoo's website. Visit HonoluluZoo.org for all the information. That's H-O-N-O-L-U-L-U-Z-O-O dot O-R-G. And when you visit, thank them for sponsoring the Jungle Deep Podcast. Jungle Deep, Deep, Deep. Hello, this is Dr. Jones. We don't just talk about tigers and toucans, elephants and orangutans on Jungle Deep. Because it is his 100 year centennial anniversary, we are also talking about the Lord of the Jungle, Tarzan. Authors, animators, actors, filmmakers, and even Tarzan himself are guests on our show. You have heard nothing like it. Listen to the podcast, Jungle Deep. Jungle Deep, 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 Deep. deep, deep. Hello, this is Dr. Jones. I believe the better you get to know the jungle's wonderful creatures, the more you will care about them. And as you care about them, you'll want to join with me in efforts to protect them and save them from extinction. I want to draw your attention to the Jungle Deep website and the ways I am promoting tropical rainforest education and conservation. In addition to the awesome expert guests and regular reports from our wonderful field correspondents on the podcast, I am building a website with resources to help everyone, especially students, find helpful and motivating information. One example is the new Wildlife Theater, which will contain a collection of photos and videos of exotic animals from the jungles around the world. Top-notch zoos and other conservation groups are contributing content to the Jungle Deep Wildlife Theater. You will find the Jungle Deep website by going to www.calaverasgold.tv. That's Calaveras, C-A-L-A-V-E-R-A-S, gold, G-O-L-D, like the mineral, dot TV, as in television, and clicking on Jungle Deep in the directory. Check the Jungle Deep website often because it's growing every week. Jungle Deep is a one-of-a-kind podcast that promotes conservation in a most entertaining way. If you want me to make more Jungle Deep episodes, let me know by making a donation to this environmental education podcast. If you would like, for a donation of $20 or more, I'll be happy to make a shout-out on the show. That's a short message about your favorite wildlife or conservation organization. You may send any amount by check mailed to me, the producer, Ken Jones at P.O. Box 61. Murphy's, M-U-R-P-H-Y-S, California, 95247. You know, most people don't make a donation and just listen to the podcast for free. That makes your donation all the more important. The core message of Jungle Deep 
is that we need more people to participate in conservation. It's not enough to love nature. These days, caring about the environment absolutely requires action. Your action in support of this show will be used to grow Jungle Deep and to help me reach more people with our conservation message. Thank you. Now, more of Jungle Deep. Deep. Well, tell us a little bit about their history. Where do they come from? Oh, I think the sloth is probably one of the coolest ancestral background. Their ancestors are, are in a group called Megatherium, and they were around about 34 million years ago. And Ken, they were as big as today's elephants. That's amazing. That is crazy. Can you think of a sloth that big? <laughs> yeah, and can you imagine walking around North and South America with a, it was a ground sloth. <laughs> So don't picture this elephant-sized animal jumping around in the trees. <laughs> it's not like that. This ground sloth was massive, and he walked around everywhere. So he didn't have those huge claws like the ones that the two and the three toads have in today's lifetime and in today's world, excuse me. They were massive and the size of elephants. And like I said, they were around 34 million years ago. Up until about 11,000 years ago, they were becoming extinct. So unfortunately, we don't see those huge animals around anymore. The current animals now have come from that animal and have adopted this amazing arboreal lifestyle. And they typically live about 10 to 20 years uh, out in the wild. In the zoos, around 30 or 40 years. They either wow. being completely taken care of, spoiled. They don't have to worry about harpy eagles snatching <laughs> them out of the trees or jaguars climbing up to get them. So they're, they're quite protected here. That's right. They mate facing each other. They kind of latch on each other. So I'm supposing it's very romantic and beautiful courtship they have. Um, normally they are solitary. It doesn't mean that they can't group together if food is plentiful like other species of animals in the world. When they do come together for mating, they wrap their arms around each other. They mate and gestation's about, depending on the species, six months to a year. And then after they have that baby, that baby hangs onto them similar to how a koala baby would, like a joey. They hang onto them and they're weaned after about a month. And then uh, hang out with mom. And after about three years, they become sexually mature for males. And four to five years, they become sexually mature for females. Wow. And they head off into the big world all on their own to start their own sloth, slow life, <laughs> and, and meet another mate. And mating, actually, there's no particular time of year. They're finding that they, they mate throughout the year. And they tend to have just one young at a time? Yes, one baby. Wow. Wow, that's a little bit slow on that reproduction that way. Stephanie, are they endangered in the wild? Out of the six species, we have two that have a concern for us, and that would be two of the three-toed species. The main and the pygmy three-toed species are endangered. But to be honest with you, Ken, they're living in the rainforest, and we know that the rainforest has some big issues, right? So to me, I think they're anything that lives in a rainforest is endangered. I have spoken to a couple co-workers that have lived or uh, have been to Central and South America, and they said there are a few species that they see are so plentiful, it's almost like, oh, just a squirrel. There is another squirrel. There is another sloth. There is another sloth. So I know that some species are plentiful, but I'm not going to lie to you, Ken. You know, with the, you know how the rainforest is. So if all it takes is us coming in and cutting down more trees, and their, their numbers could drastically decrease within a year. Obviously, there are people that are out there, some amazing organizations, even in Costa Rica. There's an organization called SlothSanctuary.com. Well, that's their website. They're actually working on preservation, conservation, rehabilitation of many different species of sloth there down in Costa Rica. So obviously, we need those people there just in case something were to happen. But of course, they are raising awareness about those, those two endangered species of three-toed sloth. Well, indeed, and we will, I want our listeners to know that we will have uh, videos and web links to this organization on the show notes page. So those that want to find out more and see these adorable animals can see some great pictures, some great videos, and get some good information on the show notes page for this episode. Yeah, so if you want to help out Sloss, what you can do is check out SlothSanctuary.com. And if you get a chance to go to Costa Rica, you can stay with them, and they have a resort, I guess, and... They offer a bunch of tours and, and such, so you would be able to get close contact with these animals, and I'm sure a, a lot of the proceeds go towards protecting these animals, which is a cool 
And then also you can go to honoluluzoo.org to learn more about sloths, as well as probably any other zoo, right? Every zoo is supporting sloths. We love them, and, and they're an amazing attraction for every zoo. Well, tell us a little bit about Kwando before we wrap it up here. I'm always curious as to what their personalities are like, if I could get to know one. Uh, you know, they, just because they're slow doesn't mean that they don't have any personality, does it? Oh, you know what? I am so in love with Kwando. I am really jealous because I had overheard that we might be getting in a female two-toed sloth to start breeding. And yeah, makes me a little bit jealous because I think he's my boyfriend. Because when I first walked in, it was love at first sight, Ken. He, he was over in the back corner and I walked in and he moved his head slowly and looked at me. And it was his feeding time, so he has been conditioned to know that at, you know, one-ish, one or two o'clock in the afternoon, he's going to receive some of his favorite fruits. So he started to come over, but I like to believe that he was coming over just for me. And, <laughs> <laughs> and you know, what? he did move a little bit quicker than I thought he did. And, you know, believe it or not, they can move about 15 feet per minute while in the trees. So I think that would actually surprise people to see how quickly he was moving. But he came over and I handed him that papaya and the apple, and he was was so he just seemed to be you know full of energy it was like he was giving us huge one burst of energy for the day and he was crawling all through the tree showing off how strong he was and how agile he was up in his trees and he was moving around pretty quick i can't tell you i don't really know Did, if, the... if he had um you know i've been with him a couple times but i haven't been able to notice if he's affectionate or any of that sort because i have heard stories about how they can periodically whip at you and you don't want those claws to come at you that is a dangerous tool and at one point during the video that i gave you that you all can watch he finishes his papaya and he starts turning towards me and he slowly moves his arm at me and i'm not quite sure what's about to happen and i'm still trying to teach the audience about him as i can see his arm coming at me so i wasn't sure if he was going to go for a swipe at me or what but it, as much as we'd want to give them a hug they're kind of awkward and in stick like they're not really cute and cuddly like you would picture maybe a koala or something like that um but i don't know maybe one day i'll get back to you ken and let you know if i if i get a chance to give kwando a hug and we'll see if he's affectionate and loving or if he's just a simple cool chill sloth <laughs> well i've seen pictures of them hanging on people as if they're giving them a hug but i've i've wondered about whether they use those claws in defense or as a weapon at all because they certainly would be very formidable if they did but I don't know if they can move fast enough to really make use of them or, or not. Now, I was wondering, too, if the zookeepers there, the keepers who work with him every day, if they would say that he, he recognizes them and oh, yeah. exhibits uh, very... I would say the keepers say that they, he, they do recognize. I think almost every animal recognizes their keeper. A, a lot of the time, I think it has to do with that connection between the keeper and the food, right? So... To be honest, yeah, I, I mean, yeah. I would say that he probably recognizes the keeper, but is it in a, an affectionate way like your dog recognizes you? I'm not quite sure. I'll have to do a little bit more research on mm -hmm. that, Ken. Mm -hmm. But I do know that they do have personalities, and some of them can be feisty, and, you know, they can move their arm quick enough to get you. And others are really chill and relaxed and comfortable around you. And, and that's quite universal with a lot of animals, so pretty cool. Well, I'm quite sure that a, a sloth is an animal I could easily spend a Saturday afternoon with. Yeah, me too. I love him. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for all that information today about sloths. And you have some special events coming up at the zoo you'd want to tell us about, do you not? We do. If you happen to be in Honolulu during Easter, we do have an event for Easter on Saturday, March 30th. You can check out our website for that event to learn more. I think we're going to have a really cool Easter egg hunt, so I'm pretty excited about that. And then, of course, we all know about Earth Day, which is Saturday, April 20th. We're going to have an event called Party for the Planet. And we're going to have vendors and organizations, wildlife organizations from all over the island coming to the zoo to post up their information, fun activities, games, and tours will be happening all day long with that event as well. So make sure you check out HonoluluZoo.org for any information, for events, ed educational information, and, of course, to check out our podcast, Jungle Deep, and any other educational videos done by myself, Steph. Well, thanks, Steph. I can say that in addition to what you've said about if you happen to be in Honolulu, that in fact, Honolulu, Hawaii is some place you don't have to happen to be. It's a place worth going to, specifically. <laughs> it's just one of the world's 
major vacation destinations, and rightly so. It's a, so it'd be worth making a special trip to Honolulu, Hawaii, and while there you just have to go to the zoo and, and say hi to Stephanie while you're there. I'm going to say goodbye to you, or, or as they say in the islands, aloha again. <laughs> <laughs> aloha, Ken, and thank you all. I can hardly wait till we talk to you again about another wonderful creature from the tropical rainforest. Bye-bye. Be sure to visit the JungleDeep.com website to see the beautiful photos and videos of sloths. There you will also find links to organizations that are helping sloths and links to additional information. The music in this podcast has been, in the intro, Jericonda Mix by Ken Jones with Apple Music Loops, Blue Jungle by the great Lex Baxter, and the segment in our episode closing is by Don Tiki called Jungle Julie. Support these wonderful artists by purchasing their music. Environmental education, wildlife preservation, tropical rainforest conservation, all wrapped up in fun, juicy, delicious American jungle culture of the past and present. Be sure to share Jungle Deep Podcast with your friends and co-workers. The show is my creation and at my personal expense. It is not currently subsidized by any business or organization, but I am ready to change that, so contact me if you would like to reach our audience with your advertising message. Audience growth is especially important for Jungle Deep to succeed and prosper, so share the show. You can see beautiful photos and learn more about Jungle Deep at our website, jungledeep.com. You gotta check it out. Where else can you go for this kind of fun? Our show notes pages have valuable links for you. I invite you to email me at ken at jungledeep.com or follow me on Twitter. Search for Jungle Deep or Ken Jones 56, all one word. I would love to hear your ideas for the show. Well, the show's over for today, so it's time to refill my Mai Tai, mount my elephant, and head back into the jungle. (laughs) 